If we have heard this text before, we've probably been invited to think about ourselves and ask ourselves, are we a Martha or a Mary, right? Are we a doer who is all about service, or are we a contemplative who likes to sit at the feet of Jesus and worship? Now, so often, Martha and Mary are pitted against one another, and this passage can kind of become a debate about how we should be in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. And while there's a lot of merit and a lot of good that can come with wrestling with this particular aspect of the scripture, today I'm going to invite us to wrestle with something a little bit different. Rather than reading it as a lesson on how we are to worship like Mary or to serve like Martha, I'd like to see what we can learn from the very human thing that happens here in this text. The very human distraction that weighs so many of us down and that we all get entangled with. In verse 41, Jesus says, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, and there is need of only one thing. What are these distractions that Jesus is talking about that's keeping Martha from focusing on what really matters? Well, of course there are the distractions of like how many pots there are to wash and how many table settings need to be put out and how many more salads need to be dished up. I'm not sure that Jesus would have been concerned so much about those distractions as he was a guest in this home and had brought along his band of disciples with him. And he had been here before, so he knew what kind of meal was at hand and what needed to be prepared. So it makes me wonder, is there a different distraction here that Jesus is talking about? Not the long to-do list. And I wonder if the distraction might be the fact that Martha is worried about what her sister is doing, or rather not doing, instead of just worrying about herself and her own actions. I mean, it's one thing to wish that your sister was in the kitchen with you, actually helping getting ready for all of these guests, but it is a whole other level to go out into the living room and complain about it to your guest of honor right, to Jesus himself of all people, who in this case is an authority figure which makes the stakes even higher in terms of what Martha is doing here. What if Jesus is saying in this text that Martha's distraction is essentially that she's being a tattletale to Jesus about Mary? Now, you could say, well, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe Mary, you know, stepped out and went to the bathroom, and Martha took that opportunity to go and say, hey, Jesus, I could really use some help in the kitchen. Please tell Mary to come and join me. But really, it doesn't matter whether Mary was sitting right there or Mary was in the other room. Essentially, Martha is telling Jesus about her problem with her sister Mary instead of speaking directly to Mary herself. She wants Jesus to step in and fix it for her to justify her viewpoint. She wants Jesus, in a way, to take her side. She wants Jesus to tell Mary what to do so that Mary can see just how right Martha is in all of this. I've always kind of cringed at this text because it's a little bit too relatable to me. I can see myself in this too much, and I think about all of the times that I have tattled on someone or vented to someone about somebody else, and it makes me realize how childish my actions are. It's almost like a classic scene from a playground. Teacher, Joey won't let me on the swing. It's my turn. He's been on there 20 minutes, and that's the rule. Tell him to get off the swing, right? Now, I listen to a lot of podcasts these days, and one of my favorites is This American Life. And recently, the host, Ira Glass, replayed a podcast kind of about fairness and justice. If you listen to this podcast, you know he always has kind of an opening clip to set the stage for what's to come. And in this episode, he was talking to a preschool teacher who had realized that over 50% of her time in the classroom was dealing with children who were tattling on other children. 
So being a teacher and being brilliant, she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. I'm going to put a tattle phone on the wall, which was really just an empty Kleenex box that she hooked on the wall, and she told the children to tell their problems into the tattle phone and that that would be the end of it. Don't come to me. Go to the tattle phone. So a dad in the classroom heard about this and was really impressed, and he's kind of a social science researcher. And he actually asked the teacher if it'd be okay if he actually put a recorder in there and recorded these tattles. Of course, he notified the parents and got all their permission and whatnot. And it's amazing how much this tattle phone was used. The children talking about their playground skirmishes and somebody not sharing the glue or the scissors, and they would come back to the phone again and again. Well, after this experiment was over, the, the dad was interviewing these preschool children, asking them their experience of the tattle phone. Like, did it work? Did it make them feel better? And one boy said, yeah, I felt good because I got to tell on the person. Another girl said, it felt good. It's kind of like eating a big bowl of ice cream. I don't know, maybe that speaks to our human need to vent and how we you know, think that it helps relieve some stress or make us feel good. But there was one child who kind of got it. He was adamant that the tattle phone did not work. And, and the guy was like, well, what do you mean it doesn't work? It's listening to your tattles. And he's like, no, it's not. And he's like, yes, it is. I can play you your recording. It was listening to your tattles. And the boy said, it didn't work. It didn't stop Augie from pinching me. That young child realized that tattling doesn't necessarily get us the action that we want. It may temporarily make us feel better to vent about a problem we're having, but unless we tell our friend Augie that he's pinching us and we don't like it, Augie's probably not going to stop pinching us. This is what this text makes me think of. Not just these preschool occurrences, but rather how this happens in our lives, in our families. I mean, think about it, a family conversation. I know, Carol, it's not fair that Mark is not helping out at all with dad's care. It should be the responsibility of all three of us kids. Why is he putting all this pressure on us? You can think about it in the workplace. Somebody walking out of a meeting, can you believe what Bob said? He doesn't even have the right data to back up his claims. Or, I really need your help, Steve. This person on my team is not pulling his weight. He's late. His deadlines are never there, and the work is incomplete. He's dragging our team down. You're the boss. Do something about it. It can happen in the church, too, right? I don't understand why that committee decided that. Why didn't they ask me what I thought? Can you believe what he said? Do you believe that? Pastor, I know there's probably nothing you can do about this, but it really bothers me when this congregation member does such and such. And it's not just me, it's a lot of other people. So can you do something about that? I know it's a touchy subject, but it's your job to deal with this stuff. We all do this, right? In all aspects of our lives. We triangulate. It's a fancy word. Triangulation is when we talk about our feelings or our opinions or personal issues regarding a person or a group with a third party, right? Instead of talking directly to the person about it themselves. Now, Karen actually explained this really well, but I have a little visual today to help us look at this as well. My three little sheep here, beloved sheep, mind you. So, this might seem elementary, but I think it's really important that we all understand this. Because when we, when we understand how we're relating to one another, we become cognizant of it and we can actually change our behavior. And that's what I think Jesus is inviting Martha to do in this text. So, triangulation is very simple. A has an issue with B. For whatever reason, A doesn't want to face off with B because he's scary. And so they run away from each other. In fact, A doesn't even approach B. Instead, B just kind of sits over here. A decides to go to C and says, hi, C, I have an issue with him. 
and this is why I have an issue with him, yada, 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 yada. And you can listen to me vent, and I appreciate that, but I also want you to do something about it. I want you to talk to B about my issue. And what happens is, if C decides to participate in this, C then goes to B and tries to explain what's going on. Meanwhile, A is waiting for the result, and it leaves B really confused, saying, why didn't A just come to me directly and talk? Find a way that we can move forward together. Because here's the thing, even if B is able to hear what this little guy says to him, it doesn't do a lick to actually resolve the conflict with this guy, right? There is no movement forward, even if they think the situation is temporarily fixed. And it's really not fair to any of the three, right? It's certainly not fair for B to be talked about behind his back and to not know that there's an issue. It's not fair to C to be put in the middle, right? Because even if C decides not to participate in this, to say, look, that is your issue, I am taking a step back, you need to deal with that, you've already drawn C into it. He already knows things that he doesn't want to know, and it might change his perception of him. And it's not fair to A either, because it's not fair to ourselves when we don't give the relationships in our lives the dignity that we should by actually dealing with problems head on. Now, this is triangulation. And I bet if we start thinking about our lives, we can think about a relationship we're in right now where we either feel triangulated or whether we're the one perhaps seeking advice, but it's not really advice, it's more of venting or trying to put our problem off on someone else. And we might even be the one that's being talked about without even knowing that we're the one being talked about. It's what's happening in today's text, too. Martha has a very simple issue with Mary, right? She's working hard in the kitchen, and she thinks that Mary is just sitting out in the living room doing nothing. And she doesn't understand it. So Martha goes to Jesus, and she does three things. First of all, which I think takes a lot of audacity, but I, I kind of get it, Martha calls Jesus into question, doesn't she? Lord, do you not care? In other words, she's kind of calling Jesus out and saying, look, if you could see this situation, you would be on my side. You would understand. Can't you have empathy for my situation? Before she even says a word by saying, Lord, do you not care? She might be making Jesus feel guilty, like, gosh, I should definitely probably care about whatever this is. The second thing is that she complains about Mary. Do you not care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? That's the moment of triangulation, right? That's the moment where somebody else gets pulled into the conversation. The moment where it really gets bad is when Martha says, tell her to come help me. In other words, intervene on my behalf. Now, I don't want to say that going to a person and asking for help and intervention is a bad thing. Not all situations where that happens is triangulation, right? Karen told our children beautifully that sometimes when you try to work something out and you can't work it out, you need to go to a third party. But that's not what I see happening here in this text. I think what's happening here is a more all too common situation in our lives where we simply don't like the behavior we're seeing and we want to vent about it and we want somebody else to do something about it because for whatever reason, we're too afraid, too insecure to take it head on ourselves. And I feel like in this moment, Jesus is saying to Martha, this is not your sister's issue, this is your issue. Jesus addresses Martha directly, which is the best thing you can do when you feel like you're being triangulated into a situation. Now, I kind of have mixed feelings about Jesus' second part of this response because he does bring Mary into it. He says, Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. 
One of my top five or top 100 questions, I don't know, that I want to ask Jesus when I get to heaven is, why is Mary's part the better part? Now, in all honesty, I'm more of a Mary than a Martha, so I could sit easy with this text saying, oh yeah, my part is the better part. I don't know why Jesus brings Mary into this. I mean, it seems to me that he's really dealing with Martha's issue. I remind myself that this is a very human encounter, and Jesus is very human, and it's not like he had time to plot out his response. He was answering in the moment. On the one hand, it seems like he could have just left Mary out of it and just dealt with Martha and her distractions herself, which might have been the ideal situation. On the other hand, maybe he felt like Mary needed to be defended in that moment, or maybe he felt like for Martha to understand, he needed to make the contrast. I don't know Jesus' motivations. I don't claim to know them. But I do know that Jesus doesn't decide to go to Mary and to tell her to get in the kitchen and help Martha. Right? He doesn't get caught in that triangulation. He may be triangulated at first, but he doesn't fall susceptible to it. Because here's the thing. The good news, I think, in this text. Jesus might be able to help Martha see things differently. Sitting down and talking to her about her behavior and maybe even talking about Mary's behavior. You know, a common situation when you go to a friend for advice about another friend, right? you might actually get some helpful input. But that's not going to do anything to resolve Martha's feelings about Mary. Jesus can't fix that. Only Martha can resolve Martha's feelings with Mary. Direct communication is the only way that healing can come. We see in Luke's gospel, in all the gospels, that Jesus can heal a lot of things. Jesus can help us forgive a lot of people, including ourselves. But Jesus cannot build or restore our relationships for us. We have to do that hard work ourselves. Jesus can give us the courage and the strength when we have to have a difficult conversation ahead. We can even practice that conversation with Jesus in prayer, but Jesus cannot have that conversation for us. We have to talk to one another. Not about one another, but to one another. And if you're like me, you struggle with this in your own family and workplace and life, and that means that we struggle together with this as a church community as well. But what better place than the church for us to get honest about ourselves and to use the times where we maybe experience these triangles with one another to stop and take a pause and think, is there a different way? Is there a different approach? I think that's what Jesus takes a moment to do in this text. And I think it is our invitation as well. Because of all the things that we learn from this. Of all the things that we learn when Jesus doesn't decide to go to Mary and tell Mary to go help Martha in the kitchen, we learn this. Jesus deals directly with us, right? God chose to deal directly with us by coming in human form. We are a people of an incarnational faith, which means Basically, things get messy, right? That they don't live up here in theory, but they live down here in practice where it's messy and real. And this is where the good stuff of relationship building happens. It's where the hard stuff of the breach of relationships happen. And it's where the really good stuff of restoration and forgiveness and rebuilding happens too. God deals directly with us through Jesus. God speaks to us directly through God's word. God renews and blesses us directly in our baptisms. God feeds us directly with nourishment in the bread and the wine at the table. God saves us directly and forgives us, not by something we do or don't do, but by grace. And we all have that direct connection to God, which reminds us that we're to have that direct connection with one another. Today, the invitation is this. 
to think about relationships in your life where you feel caught, where you feel triangulated, to think about times that you have been that person caught in the middle and what that felt like. Think about times when you've been that person who has been talked about and what that felt like. And to think about the times when you've been the one triangulating and pulling people into drama unnecessarily. This is one of those texts where none of us, I don't think, are let off the hook in any of these three roles. We've all been there. But we remind ourselves that we have a second chance, that we have the ability to ask for courage from God, to take a deep breath, to have a moment in prayer, and to go and talk to a person that we're having an issue with, and to go and say, I'm sorry if I've breached this trust, but I want to rebuild. If it can't happen here in the church, where can it happen? Amen.